Amen. Today we are discussing the source of being stressed versus the source of being blessed. Can we do that this morning? Amen. As a church, our main goal is to find and develop a relationship with Jesus. Not with just me, not with my wife, but with Jesus. Like Brother Johnson said, it's, it's about him. It's about his glory. And uh, we do that first by believing and learning the word of God. You do not do that just by coming to church. You do that by uh, learning the word of God, by listening and studying the word of God. So as we learn the word of God, how many people in here know that there are challenges? That the attacks will come, that you will have challenges with your relationships, you will have challenges with your decisions, you will have challenges in every circumstance of your life. Why? Because who you were is not who you are now. You become a new creation. And as a new creation, you have old ways that you have to let go of. And so those, those ways are tough and those challenges sometimes make us doubt God. Has anybody ever doubted God before? You can't be a child of God and haven't doubted God before. You can't be a child of God and haven't thought, are you there before? Has anybody ever had that before? Were you, were you, were you like, God, are you really there? Because if you were there, why didn't you show up? Why didn't you heal me? Why didn't you do this for me? Why didn't you provide for me? Why didn't you? And, and we all have that mindset sometimes, and it always happens. But as children of God, as children of God, we have to know that those challenges are going to happen. And those challenges are going to push our core uh, belief. It's going to push our belief and our, challenge, our trials are going to push our faith. And I want you to understand that the reason that we doubt God is not because of God. The reason that we doubt God is, is not um, because we have a, a, a thought that God isn't strong enough. It's not um, because uh, we have the thought that maybe he doesn't want us to be healed or maybe he doesn't love us. Has anybody ever had that thought that God doesn't love me, that God doesn't love you anymore? Amen. And um, we have those emotional challenges god are you there do you you don't you don't love me god are you there are you not hearing me and the reason for those challenges they make us doubt god and we we have to establish what is real and what is not real and the reality is god is strong enough and the reality is God is able. And the reality is God does love us. And, and when you understand that, then you, 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 you start taking on the true mindset of Christ and letting go of those false expectations that we have. And so uh, how many people have had the thought sometimes, well, maybe God isn't powerful enough to help me or maybe God doesn't know how to, to heal me or to help me through these circumstances. And the problem is not God is not powerful enough because God is all powerful. He has all authority. He has all capabilities. He has the, the right to do anything he wants at any time. And so now that we know that God is all powerful and we know that he is unchanging and he has an unchanging love for us, what does that mean? It means that he, he doesn't make his decisions based off of what you do. He make his decision off of what Jesus has already done. And he, his love for you is not based on your emotions. It's based on his understanding, his agape love. And so it doesn't, his, it's not conditional. His love is not conditional for us. And so um, God is all powerful, all knowing in the, 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 the problem. The, so, so we have to ask ourselves the question, then what is the problem? What is the problem? Why do we get these emotions? Why do we go from here to there? Why do we go from 10 to one in a matter of seconds? Why do we go from faith to eat to stress? Has anybody ever been there? You go from faith, man, you're on top of the world to stress. 
<laughs> Can I get an amen? Am I the only person who is experienced? You go from hallelujah to where are you? And this is as a believer. <laughs> you go from thank you, Jesus, to help me, Jesus. And so the problem, I want you to understand the main thing is that the problem is not God. All right? And so now that we've established that, we can go home and we're done. The problem is not God. So if the problem is not God, then who is the problem? Point at yourself. The problem is our understanding. Our understanding of God. God is perfect in all that he does. And but we're imperfect, but he still chose us to know him. And so it's our lack of understanding that causes the problem. And that lack of understanding makes us stumble. It doesn't make God stumble. It makes us stumble. And sometimes we think that because we come to church every week and we pray and we, 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 we fast and we do all kinds of things and we trust God and, and, and we're, we're doing everything, we're doing a Bible study and all the others, so we think that we won't stumble. We think that we shouldn't have those problems. And sometimes we, we get to a point where we feel like we are owed something from God. I go to church, God, why aren't you helping me? He's like, who do you think helped you to get to church? And so we, what happens is because we get so close to God, sometimes we think we are him, that we can dictate our, uh, God's movements with us. And it doesn't work that way. And so the problem lies not in God. The problem lies in us. We lack understanding and that lack of understanding, when we lack understanding, it makes us stumble. Then we get back up and we're hallelujah, praise the Lord. And then where are you, God, again? Hallelujah, praise the Lord. God, why haven't you showed up? Hallelujah, praise the Lord. God, please help me. And so I want to give you in Hosea. Um, chapter four, verse five and six, as God addresses the people and the prophets, everybody say, and the prophets. This is what he says. You stumble day and night and the prophets stumble with you. So I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge of what the world know of God. The lack of knowledge, the problems we have are not the world. The problems we have are understanding God. And as we learn to understand him, we understand that he is perfect. He does not make mistakes, but we do. And so that lack of knowledge is the problem, not that they don't know God. It's not saying you don't know God. Everybody in here who has accepted the Lord, raise your hand or give God a round of applause in the house of the Lord. You, 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 so you know God. And so you know God. And it's not that you don't believe in God because you've accepted him. You believe in God. But it's because with these men and women of God, they lacked the knowledge of God in the circumstance they were dealing with. And so you can know God all you, all you want to. You can praise and you can worship him. But if you're not trusting him in the circumstance, the way he wants you to trust, not your own trust, but his faith, then what happens is you lack understanding. And that lack of knowledge can cause destruction in your life, just like it caused destruction in their lives. He said they will stumble day and night and the prophets will stumble also. And so man, woman of God, people, members of the church, all of us can stumble if we're not focused on the prize, on God. And so how do we stumble? How do we get into those situations because you, we read the word of God and the closer you get to reading the word of God and understanding the word of God, guess what? You can stumble more. <clears throat> Look at this. If you think 
that because you accepted Jesus, how many people accepted Jesus in here? Say amen. amen. If you think that because you accepted Jesus, that you can then jump off a building and survive or walk into traffic and not get hit, guess what? You lack the knowledge. And because of that lack of knowledge, it can cause your death. And what we do is we blame God for things we permit. And so because you accepted Jesus doesn't mean you can jump out of a plane and without a parachute and live. It doesn't mean that you can run through the worst, uh, uh, worst place in town and not get robbed. Our understanding of God is what helps us, but our lack of understanding is what hinders us. And sometimes we think we're holier than thou. We can do it. Oh, God is going to be with me. Then you're in the hospital like, Lord, where were you? I was right there. I didn't tell you to go in there. And so for us as children of God, God, you know, even though we don't listen sometimes, people don't listen. Raise your hand. Yeah, everybody guilty. Everybody, look, somebody pointing at their wife, like her. <laughs> and the wife's got two hands pointing back at the husband. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the, the, because we don't listen to God and we don't understand God all the time, sometimes because of that, we get the results of that. But it doesn't mean that we are not still blessed. And that is the important thing to, to gather this morning. It doesn't mean that we are not still blessed because God says you are blessed. And so I want you to look at your neighbor and say, God says you are blessed. Now, the important thing is you must understand what he means when he says you are blessed, not taking it and creating your own version of what blessed is. Look at your neighbor and say, I am blessed. All right. So now we need to find out what he's talking about when he says we are blessed. How better to find out than by visiting the Beatitudes? The Beatitudes is in Matthew, uh, the fifth chapter. It's when Jesus had a multitude of people following him. He had uh, thousands upon thousands, literally thousands of people. Has anybody ever watched that, um, that series that they have that you can watch? It's called The, the Chosen. Has anybody ever watched that? It, it get, you know, but you, know you, you get people saying, well, it's not totally scripturally correct. Nothing is scripturally correct. OK, but it's your job to look and take the things that are of God and, 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 and let go of the things that are not. But I tell you what, you know, watching that is pretty powerful because it gives you a actual visual of what's going on. Visual of Jesus turning the water to wine, visual of the different things happening biblically. And it helps you to, to get a better visual. And sometimes you find yourself, has, has anybody found themselves looking at that man and saying, oh, Jesus, he's not Jesus, he's not really Jesus. But you start to think of him, you start to think of Jesus and how he was and how he mingled with the people and how he talked to him and stuff like that, just by watching that. And it's, it's a pretty powerful thing to watch because, you know, we're supposed to take the word of God and just decipher and look at things and say, okay, that's not true. Or that is true. Or, you know, and go from there, but it's a good series to watch. I, I really like that. And so God says we are blessed. However, we must understand what it means when he says we are blessed. And so we're going into the Matthew, the fifth chapter, when Jesus had a multitude of people following him, which he did all the time. Why? Because he was healing them and feeding them. And so he had um, uh, thousands of people tracking him down, trying to find him, trying to find every place he walked. There were people uh, walking behind him, in front of him, around him, trying to, you know, trying to touch his garments, trying to just be around him. And so um, this is in what this, this is happening when or, or, or on what they call a mountainside. Uh, it says uh, he went up that mountainside and he sat down to teach. This is where uh, you get the famous description. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Everybody ever heard that? The Sermon on the Mount. This is that Sermon on the Mount because he was on an incline, a mountainside, and he was preached or had a sermon that he was speaking to the crowd, the crowd that gathered. There was thousands upon thousands of people who gathered. It was an abundance of people in that crowd. 
And so we want to discuss these beatitudes so that you will not, I guess the, the best way to say it, um, it's not about what will happen that's important. It's about what has happened by you accepting the Lord that's important. And so the Beatitudes give you a vision on what you should be doing, but you, the change has already happened in your heart. You have accepted the Lord as your savior. And so in Jesus Christ, our desire is to be blessed. How many people's desire is to be blessed? You want to be blessed according to what God says. Sometimes we think from our worldly view and we say, I want to be blessed. What is the one I want to be blessed? I want money. I want success. I want this. That's not what blessed is. And so, uh, G so let me be clear on that. Money is not the foundation for blessing and it's not the foundation for cursing. The love of it is. That's where it becomes, and that's where we get lost because some people think, well, I don't need money. I need, I don't need, well, now, you still have to pay rent. You still have to pay mortgage. You still have to pay things. And so you, it's not, it's not, it's not money. It's the love of it. And so we've got to gather what he's talking about when he says we are blessed. And so um, I want to discuss these beatitudes uh, so that we can be in Christ. The whole purpose of why we come here is to learn the word of God and apply it. Everybody say learn, learn. and apply. All right. And so Jesus gives a true understanding of what it is to be blessed. And so it's our duty to make sure we understand it so we are not destroyed for lack of understanding. Amen. That's what we want to do. And so the Beatitudes or uh, or literally the it, they're, they're, they mean the blessed um, or the happy um, sayings. It means blessed or happy sayings. Um, and so they were meant to describe who we become when we follow Jesus, not who we were, but who we are. And so remember, we don't change God. God changes us. And so because uh, you know, sometimes we think, well, I'm going to turn, I'm going to change God's mind. Well, no, no, you don't change God's mind. God's mind is perfect. He, he what he does is he changes your mind to align with his. And so, um, Jesus speaks spiritually. Every time Jesus speaks, he speaks from a spiritual standpoint. And so the first thing he says in these Beatitudes is he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, the Greek word translated into poor literally means a beggar. It literally means a beggar. Or, and, and it also means dependent on others for support dependent on others for support. And so what are we dependent on others for support with? Well, it, because it says we are the poor in what? Spirit. It didn't say poor in life. It says poor in spirit. And so what are we dependent on others for? So um, what are we dependent on others for, for support? Well, spiritually, this, this meaning, it, it, it makes us understand who we are. We are morally bankrupt. We, you know, without God, we have no access to him. We are morally bankrupt. Without God, we are incapable of saving ourselves. It's not our works that saves us. It is Jesus who saves us. And so we are morally bankrupt. We are incapable of saving ourselves. We don't, we can't do anything spiritually to connect to God. We can't go to God and say, God, I was in the church and I stayed in the church for 43 years. In, in 43 years, I saved 2,000 people. God said, depart from me. You didn't save one. I saved. You don't save. And so we are morally bankrupt. We are incapable of saving ourselves before a righteous God. And so he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And so the apostle Paul, I want to read this. The apostle Paul in the book of Romans explains us exactly Prior, without knowing Jesus. He explains us exactly, um, you know, with, without uh, under, uh, us understanding God. And he references the Psalms. And I want to read Romans 3, verse 10 through 18. This is what he says. There is no one that is righteous. Y'all hear that? He says, none. There are none. There are none. There, are, there is no one that is righteous, not even one. 
There are no, there is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have all together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Look at your neighbor and say, not even you. It says their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And so the truth be told, we have no spiritual assets without God. We can't make ourselves right without God. But the rest of the sentence says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And so even though we are morally bankrupt without God, we do have God. Even though we are, 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 are poor, the Bible says we are rich. Wait a minute. If, if, if the Bible says we are poor, it also says we are rich. So what does it mean? We are poor in spirit without God, but we are rich in spirit because God. And so um, this is talking about spiritually. It's talking about us as children of God being incapable, but made capable. Being poor, but made rich. Morally bankrupt, but made spiritually rich. The ones with no spiritual assets were given spiritual accountability through Jesus. We were incapable of going before the Father. Now we can go before him on our knees or while we're driving or while we're walking or while we're talking or while we're playing music. We can go before him anytime because of what Jesus has done for us. We were incapable, totally separated, but God reconnected us through Jesus. Do you understand that? Thousands of years ago, when people would go into the Holy of Holies, if you were not pure, you would be struck dead. Now, every time we say Jesus, we go before the Holy of Holies, and not only do we go righteous, we go righteously made because of what Jesus has done. And so the ones who were completely wrong were made completely right. And that was through Jesus. Does everybody understand that? It was through Jesus. It's not the condition of your bank account or your life. The condition of your bank account or your life is the result of your doing. And so if you look at your bank account and say, I'm wealthy because of God and I'm doing things right. And the Lord, no, 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 no. That's not what it means. It's because you did things right and invested properly that you that 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 you receive things in your bank account. But that doesn't make you right with God. What makes you right with God is the one who died on the cross. And so. The, 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 the conditions of that, the condition of your bank account is because of you. And so because what happens sometimes we say, well, I'm broke because I'm not listening to God or I'm rich because I'm listening to God. No, you're exactly where you're at because of what you've done. And if you want that to change, you have to change. Stop blaming God for your condition and do something about it. And so you were incapable of saving yourself but made capable of being saved through Jesus. Look at your neighbor and say, God is doing his part. Now do yours. <laughs> the second one, it says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. He's telling you what it is to bless, blessed are, to be blessed. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. The Greek word translated into mourn, uh, uh, the English word mourn, means to grieve in, as in severe loss. And Jesus is telling them, blessed are those who grieve. Blessed are those who mourn. And what Jesus is referencing is the type of mourning to, um, to severe grief, grief based on what? It's based on sin, those who mourn over sin. Guess what? The closer you get to God, the more you turn against sin. And the closer you get to God, the more you just cry out and say, God, I'm not worthy. Thank you, Lord. 
the more the closer you get to God, the more you realize how insignificant you are, but he still chose you. And, and, and whether you like it or not, you are made right before the Father. And whether you like it or not, he made the insignificant significant so that you would be able to go before the Father. He's saying, blessed are those who are so grieved by sin because they understand the condition that they are in, that they were in. He's saying that those people will be comforted by the Lord. And this is what happens as a believer first accepts the Lord. You're just thankful and you accept the Lord. But as you grow closer, you realize how you didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it, but you've been given it. And you, you start to, yeah, God starts to get bigger and you start to get smaller. You start to realize the joy of what he has done for you. And it's irreversible. And so you're so excited about what God has done. You're not focused on you. You're focused on him. And so who does that type of mourning that he's talking about? It's like once you get saved, you're excited, you walk away. No, once you get saved, that salvation walk makes you cry out to the Lord more. How many people cried more once you got saved than you did prior to? Before you were tough. Or what you call tough in the world. Like, I ain't crying. Man, I ain't crying over nothing. It's tough. Now this, you, know, you, you accept the Lord and some things, some onions are always in your face. And every time you come to church, you're like crying. It's like, what is all, what's all this stuff that's running down my face? You cry more once you get closer to God. Why? Because you realize where you're at. You realize your condition. You realize that he's with you. You realize that he never leaves you. You realize that he's perfect. You realize that you're imperfect. You realize that you're made right. You realize that you're renewed, that you're restored, that you're made right in the eyes of God. When you realize that, the closer you get to God, the smaller you get. And that grieving, it never stops. You always thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me because I am not, I've not earned it. Thank you, Lord, that you saved me, even though you knew all those crazy things I would do. Thank you, Lord, that you removed all the bones that I had, the cemetery of bones that I had in my closet. The things I didn't tell people, you renewed me up. That's what happened. And who does that? Saved people do that. That's why every Sunday we come in here, people are crying and praising the Lord. It never gets tired. We've been doing this for years and people are still crying. Why? Because you have changed. Verse 5 says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The commentary says it perfect, that it is impossible to translate the Greek word uh, that we translate to meek. Um, it's, it's impossible to translate it in just the one word, just one word. Why? Because it, for us, it may mean meek, but it means a multitude of things in the Greek terms. Um, the, and so the, 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 it's, the reference is, is multiple uh, variation. Meek to us means quiet, gentle, easily imposed. But the Greek word that we translate it to meek, it doesn't just mean gentle. It's referencing strength also. So you're gentle and you're strong. It's not just strong, but it's, it's not strong to where it's overbearing, but it's strong to where it's gentle, but you know who you are. As a child of God, you can be gentle, but you still know who you are. You can be the lamb and you can be the lion. And, and so you understand who you are. You, you can say yes, but you can also say no. You can, you can tell when somebody's legit or, or sincere, but you can also tell when they're pulling the wool over your eye. You get what I'm saying? This, this, this is a, it's a variation of meekness. You're, you're, you're nice to them. You can show love, but you can deny them also. And so it's talking about, it's not a soft weakness, but it's more like a controlled strength. And Jesus is saying that those type of people will never let God down. Why? Because it's all about him and not about them. 
and, and, and in return, it's letting you know that God always makes sure that they get justice when they trust him. And so if you show the love of God, but you're not a, a pushover, and, and, and you show the love of God, but you know when to be softer. See, there's some people I can talk to and say, man, suck it up. And there's some people I talk to and say, hey, you know, got to walk with them, got to help them, got to comfort them, got to give them hugs. And then, then the same person years down the line, like, man, you need to get right. And then uh, you know, another time you're hugging them and walking with them and, and showing love. You see, this is what happens as we come into Christianity. We know who we can and we know who we cannot. We're meek, but we, yet we're strong. And, and there are people you can say, man, you're just a baby. It's going to be okay. And then there's people who say, you need to get out of them diapers. There's people we say, hey, man, it's, it's good. You're on milk. And there's people we say, well, you need some meat. Stop living like that. Stop making excuses. And so this, this meekness that it's talking about is also a version of strength. And Jesus is saying that these people will not let God down. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the, the, the earth. And so it's, 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 I hope you're beginning to understand that the blessing that, that Jesus is talking about it's not in the world, it's in Christ. Does it happen to you in the world when you make good decisions? Yes, but it's not based on the world, it's based on Christ. He is the foundation. I, I, I hope you're beginning to understand that. The, the person of the beatitude, or the, with the beatitude mindset, um, these people are balanced by the, not by the status quo or, or by the measurements uh, you know, given by the world, but they're balanced through Jesus. They're grounded in Jesus. That is what helps you. It's never uh, about, it's never been about money. It's always been about position. You get that? It's never been, you can have all the money in the world and not know God. Get that? You can have all the money in the world and not know God. Or you can be broke and not have anything and not know God. So it's, ne it's never been about what you have or what you don't have. It's been about who you know. When you know God, if he can trust you with a little, he'll trust you with more. When your focus is him, when you're grounded in Jesus, when your intentions are right, when you have the right mindset and the right heart, God will bless you. So people say, I've been praying, I've been praying and asking. Well, no, it's not God, it's you. Where is your heart? What is your intention? Because God already knows it. And so our lack of knowledge of God's word is what destroys us. The heart of God makes or breaks the person where you are at in the Lord. Number verse, uh, verse six, it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now, I want you to understand that none of y'all came here just because of me. None of y'all came here this morning just because you wanted to see my wife or you wanted to see my children or you wanted to see my family. You didn't come here because of that because you can go to any church for that. You came here because you wanted the Lord, because you desire God. You want to worship him. You want to seek his counsel. You want to seek his godliness. You want to receive his healing. You want to receive his joy, his patience, his forbearance. You want to receive what he has for you. That's why you come. And so the reason you come back is because of God. You come back because God continues to fill you with his Holy Spirit. He continues to fill you. He continues to repair you as you are broken by the world. How many people know that the world can break you sometimes? You can be overwhelmed sometimes. As a Christian, you can feel some kind of way sometimes. As a Christian, you can feel overpowered sometimes. As a Christian, you can feel broken down. You can feel run amok. You can feel in the, the ditch as a Christian. But what happens is he continues to repair you even when you're broken. He continues to satisfy you 
even as you're hungry. Because the word says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled by God. It, you're, you're filled with, your hunger is fulfilled when you seek God. Your hunger, your thirst is quenched when you seek God. Guess what happens after that? You get thirsty again. You get hungry again. And guess what happens? If you do not seek God who will feed you, you will seek the world who will not satisfy you. And so verse seven says, blessed are those who are merciful for they are shown mercy. As you continue to realize the mercy God has shown for you, it becomes easy to show mercy on others. When you know that God has saved you, why are you, he saved you from all the mess you've done? from the undeserving salvation, he's given it to you. When you look at your friend who owes you a hundred bucks, you're like, man, bump that hundred. Man, bump all that. I'm not worried about and stressing over that. I'm not going into that wor world of worry. Why? Because what's in me is greater than what's against me. What God has given me is more stronger than worrying about $20 or worrying about $5 or worrying about $1,000. You just worry about who God is and what he has done and what he has restored you from. And so as you continue to realize the mercy God has shown for you, you're not worried about uh, showing mercy for somebody else. You're not worried about whether they're deserving or whether they're undeserving. He doesn't deserve my forgiveness. You didn't deserve the forgiveness God has given you. Why are you worried about that? Just forgive them and move on. Oh, I'm talking to somebody this morning. A forgiving heart receives a forgiving reward. Y'all get that? A loving heart receives a loving reward. Like nobody loves me. Maybe you should start loving somebody else first before you worried about who loves you. Maybe you should learn what love is. Because coming to church doesn't make you love. Coming to Christ makes you love. You can be in church all you want, but you can get home and curse somebody out and treat somebody wrong and talk to somebody the way you want to talk to them. And guess what? It's an audience of one. You're serving God. He's watching everything you're doing. He's watching your heart. And that's why you're not receiving the things you want. Because your heart is wrong. Hmm. And so, <laughs> how many kitchens we in this morning? And so, a, a loving heart received a loving reward. A good seed sown on good ground reaps a good reward. <laughs> look, look, you can plant all the seeds you want, but if you plant uh, rotten apples, if you plant negative seeds, guess what you're going to get? A negative harvest. Like, but, but I've been trying. I've been working. I've been doing this. I've been, no, no. We, but it's the heart. Where's your heart? What is your concern? You're like, well, I don't know what he's doing with my business. Well, what are you doing with your wife? Or what are you doing with your husband? Or what are you doing with your children? Or how are you treating your household? Blessed are those who seek God. And so as you continue to, to understand this, verse 8 says, blessed are the pure at in heart, for they will see God. Proverbs 10, I want to read 1 through 9 because this proves this very point. This is a totally different book. Let me read what it says. A wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish son brings grief to his mother. Ill-gotten treasures have no lasting value, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord does not let us uh, let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. Mm. Lazy hands make for poverty. Uh Oh, hello. Let me read that again. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. You keep reading. He who gathers crops in the summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in during the harvest is a disgraceful son. Blessings crown the head of the righteous, but violence overwhelms the mouth of the wicked. The name of the righteous is used in blessings, but the name of the wicked will rot. 
The wise in heart accept command, but a chattering fool comes to ruin. <laughs> whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever walks crooked or whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. <laughs> I mean, what do you need, family? Do things right. So he goes on and on and on implying the same facts about what Jesus was talking about. There's, there's an old saying um, that God, God doesn't bless no mess. Anybody ever heard that? God don't bless no mess. I didn't say it was improper. It was properly written. It's improper English. God don't bless no. But y'all know what I mean. And so God don't bless no mess. That's incorrect. Why? Because he blessed you. Every one of us, none of, none of us deserve eternal life, but he gave it to all of us. Can you give God honor and glory in his house this morning? He gave us all. <laughs> I'm getting chills because I don't know if we really understand what he's given us. When we're in heaven, we're going to be slapping hands and, and just excited. But as we walk on earth, you must walk with a pure heart, with good intentions, honest intentions integrity and God will bless the seeds that you sow when you do things in order with him not in order with you blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God this is not saying peacemakers uh, that because peace was actually there when you arrived this is talking about you going in chaotic situation and because the peace of God is on you, the, the situation doesn't convert you. You convert the situation because of the work that God has done on your heart. If they're cursing, you don't come in cursing with them. You bring the peace of God that surpasses all understanding and you spread it to them. And so blessed are the peacemakers, not the peace takers. See, you're, you're, you're not supposed to take peace. You're supposed to create peace. But they get on my, uh, no, 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 no. And what if God said the same thing you said? I know I gave you salvation, but <laughs> you're pushing me. What if he said the same thing we said? We're supposed to show the peace of God regardless of how the circumstance is because within us is greater. What God has given us is greater than what's against us. And so no matter what they say, no matter how they operate, you're supposed to operate in peace. You're supposed to bring peace to the situation. And so blessed are the peacemakers. If you notice, none of these things are based on circumstances. All of these things are based on God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. <laughs> For theirs is the kingdom of, of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Blessed are, are you when people insult you. Oh, who's been insulted? Feelings. Who had a toilet tissue feeling? Anybody? You get emotional. Everything hurts you. It, it bothers you. You want to get back. You want to get revenge. Anybody in here? Everybody raise your hand because everybody's been there. Stop acting like y'all church all your lives. You're like, I don't know what he's talking about. Yes, you do. You're offended now. How dare you? <laughs> what are you talking about? Blessed are you when people insult you. As a child of God, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to be insulted. And you're going to feel what? And here's the problem. Sometimes it happens in this room. Sometimes you get your feelings hurt in here. And what are you going to do? Because how many people have ran or wanted to run from a church because you got offended? Oh. Whew. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. That's what Jesus is saying. Because you're showing love, people, look, 
I, I've heard some of the craziest things. You know, we even had some issues in the very beginning of the church where people were saying things like, you know, he paid for his car with the church money. I'm like, what do you mean? I got a minivan. We ain't paid for nothing with the church money. <laughs> and at that time, we didn't have any money. So it's just crazy stuff that, that comes in and, and I can have the choice, me and my wife can have the choice to get offended or move on. And those are your choices also. Be offended or move on. And so if you are persecuted for doing what is right in God, that's okay because the word says you will be persecuted. You will be insulted. You will feel that way sometimes. Falsely things will be said against you. I was talking to somebody while we were in praise and worship outside the church and they were saying false things about the church. This is day. Today, while y'all were praising, I was outside. Cindy saw me because she came running out there like the cherub of justice. <laughs> Trying to figure out what's happening. I was like, calm down. It's okay. We're good. We're good. <laughs> oh, my. yeah. The lotion didn't bring Mr. Johnson with her. We're good. <laughs> oh, man. People, yeah, you were running outside. I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> stretching and <laughs> my family is <laughs> hey, I gotta calm y'all down because you pull a few with y'all oh man so if you are persecuted for doing what is right it's okay you're supposed to do what's right integrity, love you're serving God, you're not serving people so I want to read from 1 John 4 um, because if we're persecuted, we know that we're in Christ. And here's the thing. We stress uh, when we don't understand or see an immediate result. But God knows what he's doing. And God, it doesn't make us any, it doesn't make him any less capable because we're stressing. But it's overrated to stress. And so this first John four, verse four, this is what it says. You dear children are from God and have overcome them. He's talking about the false teaching, the enemy, the devil. You have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. You are greater. You are better than that. And so you are blessed because you were incapable of being saved, but God saved you. That's what blesses you. Because you were incapable, but God made you capable. He made you right. But in order to go before the Father, you had to first be made right. If not, you will be convicted of every sin, condemned of every sin you have committed and sent to hell. But because you have been made right, you have been made righteous. Jesus was made sin and you were made the righteousness of God. Can you honor God and bless his name this morning? And so you are blessed because you were incapable, but made capable. Say that. Say, I am blessed, I am blessed because, I was incapable, because I was incapable and God made me capable. God made capable. What does that mean? It doesn't mean you're going to have everything you want on this earth. It doesn't mean you won't go through challenges. It doesn't mean you won't have insults and, and have false accusations brought against you because it's quite the opposite. But when those things happen, you can say, I'm blessed. Why? Not because you have money or because you don't. You're blessed because God has saved you. That is it. That's what blesses us. And because of that blessing, you then become meek, but strong. You then become hungry and seek God. And you then get filled, but then want more. You then get thirsty, but then he quenches your thirst. And then you get thirsty again and you seek him. And then you have highs and you have lows. But you know in the end that God has saved you. He has set you apart. He has made you right. And because of that righteousness, you can access him. And our focus should be God. It should not be our circumstances. But stop blaming God for the things you permit. Stop blaming God for your financial situation when you've never tried a business. Stop blaming God when you've never opened or did the right thing. Stop blaming God for the job you have. Stop blaming God for the pay you don't get. 
There's a reason he let somebody below you get more than you. And because of the blessing, we understand and we become merciful because we know God was merciful to us. And we know that we'll be persecuted and we know that we'll, we'll be attacked, but we carry peace with us because we know that peace is what God has given us. Why? Because the source of being stressed is not God. It's you. The source of being stressed is not your job. It's your choices. The, 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 the choice that we take each and every day, the choices that we make that are improper, that are improperly gauged in God. The source of being stressed is you accepting the ways of the devil and not accepting the ways of God. Does there, does that, did I make that clear? Stop blaming the devil for things you permit. Stop, stop, stop all that. The devil's attacked. No, you're, <laughs> did you understand what happened to Job? He only got attacked because God permitted him to be attacked. But he also got blessed in the end. Why? Because he didn't give in to the enemy. He gave in to God. So I'm not saying you won't get attacked, but when it happens, you need to know who your God is, who your rock is, who your strength is, who your protection is. You need to know who the light is in your life. And so the source of being stressed is you and giving into the enemy. But the source of being blessed is God in understanding his purpose for your lives. Can you give God honor and glory in his house this morning? Look at your neighbor and say, I am too blessed, am too blessed to, be to be stressed. All right. Say it again. I am too blessed, am too blessed to, be to be stressed. All right. Let's repeat after me. I want you to let's stand and let's pray. I want you to say, if you believe this, say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus come into my heart. Into my heart. Make, me Make me a new creation. Let my old ways pass away. Ways pass away. And all things become new. I believe that you gave your life on the cross to save my life through the cross. And by your wounds, I am healed from the confines of death. Permit me to be your disciple and abide by the name of Jesus until my last day on earth. Today, I believe that by your blood, I am truly saved. Can you honor God in the house of the Lord?